Shalom, shalom, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Pulse of Israel here in our internal and ancestral homeland, the land of Israel, in our eternal, beautiful, biblical, and indivisible capital, Jerusalem, since King David's time. When I was in South Florida, I had the wonderful opportunity to interview former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. Unfortunately, the audio in the beginning was a little off, so I wanted to tell you the first question I asked him that he was answering. And that question was, what were your thoughts on October 7th? And David and his family were in Israel at the time. And he started by answering how his grandchildren reacted to the onslaught and the massacre that we experienced on that day, the Jewish holiday of Simchat Torah. So here you go, my interview from South Florida with former U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. Well, the world that want to kill us, you know, uh, first time they were old enough to really appreciate what was happening and couldn't understand why are people indiscriminately shooting rockets that could, you know, that could end up killing people who they've never met, they don't know. I mean, uh, how much could they hate us if they want to kill us without even knowing us? And, uh, you know, that's from a 12-year-old girl, you know, and it's a shame that you have to even have that conversation, let alone experience and experience it in real time. Um, then, you know, you know, as uh, I had time to reflect, I mean, uh, answering your question, um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, um, you know, deeply uh, frustrated and disappointed at how the world has changed in the last three years. And, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, and I, I actually think this was all easily predictable, um, uh, you know, this began, you know, I, as I tell people, you know, um, when we got out of the JCPOA, Iran did not immediately begin to enrich uranium. They began to enrich uranium after we lost the election. You know, that's mm. when they began. And so, it began to be predictable from then that we were getting weaker and weaker and weaker and enemies were getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And, uh, and their hatred for us was certainly not abating. You know, and so uh, one could not predict any particular you know, catastrophic, catastrophic events, certainly nothing like this. You know, that, that border hadn't been breached in 50 years. But, um, but you know, it is hard to watch as the, the world just spirals down to a point, a point of real chaos, uh, not just for the Jewish people, but obviously including very, very acutely the Jewish people. So um, it's just hard to watch. I mean, I think all of this uh, was preventable. I think it's still, I think it's still preventable if we uh, take action now, uh, at least that's the future events. But uh, boy, have we, uh, you know, have we sunk to a level that I never thought we would experience. Do you think Israel, I, I hate the question, because there's just so many things wrong with, with the assumptions of this question. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, it's the geopolitical reality we're living in. Do you think Israel will be allowed to do what is necessary to end every sort of potential threat from the Gaza Strip towards Israel so that Israeli citizens can move back down to their homes down south without feeling that they're potentially another threat against them? Well, look, I, I, I think, I think um, uh, the question is largely irrelevant because they have no choice. So whether they're allowed or not, and the only country they really care about is, is the U.S. Um, I don't know where they're going. I don't know where Biden is going because he's giving mixed messages right now. He's giving a message to Israel, uh, a very good message to Israel. You know, we stand with you against Hamas. Hamas is, uh, is, is a barbaric organization. He, he's gone through the litany of their atrocities and he's said, I support Israel eradicating Hamas. Then he turns around and he says to, um, to the left or to the, you know, sends a message to the Palestinians that, you know, we're going to put in the PA to run the place and we're going to have a two-state solution. And, you know, every Palestinian life is precious and we have to stop the, uh, the killing of civilians. And at the end of the day, I don't, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what he's, what, where he's going. And I think it's, you know, a function of the fact that, you know, we're in an election year. Um, there's a lot of politics. You got places like Michigan where, you know, uh, Biden needs to carry an extremely high majority of the Muslim vote. Right now he's far behind. So, you know, he's trying to send these mixed messages. Of course, in a 24-hour news cycle, you're able to hear all the different messages and put them side by side, and they are um, somewhat inconsistent with each other. So I don't know where America is going to be, uh, certainly not under this administration, but I'm not sure it matters because at the end of the day, if... Israel cannot provide um, uh, an environment of quiet, of real quiet, to, the, um, to those who live in the south, those poor people who were displaced. 
um, it, 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 it's it's not fulfilling its primary mandate as a as a as a nation, not just as a Jewish nation, as any nation. A nation that cannot protect its citizens is not a nation. Okay, that's the first rule of being a nation. So that's why nations were formed in the first place. Right. That's so, the that's the first responsibility of a government. First responsibility. So they have to be able to do it, and so. Um, at the end of the day, Israel, I think, will, will you know, kind of have to suffer through whatever criticism it receives from the world in order to get back to a place of quiet. The, the better question is how you get there, which, you know, is another issue because you're dealing with millions of people who are radicalized. I mean, this is not, um, you get rid of Hamas and you're left with a bunch of Canadians and Norwegians, you know. Right. And um, I don't know how that gets resolved, but it's a. I think Israel can restore quiet simply by dismantling all the military infrastructure. I don't know how it can ever leave. You know, maybe maybe there'll be some pleasant surprise down the road where it, there's an opportunity. I don't see how it can leave. And then the question is, while it's there, is there anything it can do to transform Gaza into a place which is less threatening and less lethal? And uh, but that's a really long-term, long-term uh, proposition. So I want to jump from the south to the north, following the exact uh, message you were giving right now, which I 100% agree with. Israel has to do everything necessary, despite whatever international pressures, especially from the Biden administration, mm -hmm. to ensure that people down south can move back to their homes down south. But the same question applies to the north, because Israel evacuated hundreds of thousands of, of, of Israeli citizens on the northern border, and they don't want to move back until Hezbollah is taken care of, which basically means that this, this war can't end until Israel gets rid of the Hezbollah threat up north. How does that play into the potential of taking place? Because again, if it doesn't happen, the people up north are not running, going back to their homes, because they know Hezbollah will do exactly what Hamas did. So it's far more complicated there, obviously, because Hezbollah is a much more, um, much much more challenging enemy uh, because Hezbollah has, um, I mean, they're both tied to Iran, but Hezbollah is, is a direct proxy of Iran. I mean, they're both Shia, they're both Shiites. They're much more aligned with each other than Hamas is aligned with either one. And um, and you know, it does in the case of the U.S. implicate potentially yet another war where the United States actually. Will, will will need to to get involved. I, my own view is that I think this is this is again. You have to be a real, real kind of starry-eyed optimist to think this will get better with time. And I think that you know Israel is prepared. And I think that if there is uh, a way to, um, to 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 end the the reign of Hezbollah, it should be considered. It, it, but it is it is a war on a different scale with um, more players uh, that potentially could. You know, expand greatly, and and I I don't want to, I don't want to be flippant about it. You know, I mean, obviously, we don't like to wipe out Hezbollah. The, the one thing I would say to you, though, about Hezbollah, which I think is a little bit different than Hamas, is this: um, because of Hezbollah's strength, um, Israel is not going to go. Uh, if there's a real war, Israel is not going tit for tat with Hezbollah. I mean, you know, uh, Hezbollah has precision guided weapons that can really strike at the core of some of Israel's most important assets. Yeah, every asset of Israel, basically. And, and, and Lebanon doesn't have any assets, right, that are, that are comparable. You know, so it's, 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 you know, Hezbollah has a, has a significant advantage, and Israel will be under tremendous pressure, and Hezbollah knows this, to end the war as quickly, decisively, and, and, and brutally as possible. So I think what you're looking at is a circumstance where you know, I know this is rhetoric, but it has some truth to it that it, you know, Lebanon will be bombed back into the Stone Age. So, what is that? Where does that leave Hezbollah at that point? You know, Hezbollah right now is, is very strong. They have control over Lebanon. They have um, the ability to threaten Israel, which they do f frequently. Every day, right now. But but it is to a certain extent kind of a one shot deal because once they go from threatening to fighting, okay, they're going to get set back twenty years, and then what do they do? Um, they're not going to destroy Israel. They're going to hurt Israel. Israel's going to hurt them much, much worse. And then, you know, from the perspective of Iran, who's kind of running the show here, is Iran any better off? And what have they achieved? So um, I'm not sure uh, why it's in Hezbollah's interest to start a war. Obviously, if they wanted to start a war, they would have started the war on October 7th when they had real, real opportunity right. to inflict massive damage, unfortunately, right. because Israel wasn't ready for them. 
So I don't know the answer. It's much more complicated and uh, probably a much longer discussion. So I want to go back to the Biden administration because uh, thankfully when you were working together with President Donald Trump under his administration, one of, it was a small decision, but huge implications, meaning a huge decision really, was the stopping of funding to UNRWA. Yeah. And anyone in the know, and I know plenty of politicians on Capitol Hill know this, mm-hmm. UNRWA is basically Hamas. Yep. Hamas runs UNRWA, which means that children in Gaza and even Judea and Samaria, they are educated by United Nations funded money to hate Jews and kill Jews and destroy the Jewish state of Israel. So here I am sitting here trying to figure out how Israel is supposed to end the terror threats of Hamas when U.S. taxpayer money and European taxpayer money is used to this day to fund UNRWA, which means no matter what Israel does to end Hamas, U.S. taxpayer money will continue to go to continue fu- funding the, 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 the support of, of killing Jews. H- how is one supposed to grapple that with on one hand they say we support Israel on the other hand they're actually funding the enemy and the killing we, of Israelis we've been we've been doing this um, more than once in the Biden administration they're funding both sides of the war you know like what is the point of funding both sides of the war it doesn't make any sense um, UNRWA has been a, 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 a disease you know uh, it, it, it puts on these you know a fourth grade play and a guy's at school, you know, has half the kids dressing up as terrorists, half the kids dressing up as Jews. The terrorists kill the Jews. The Jews lie dead on the floor. The parents get up and clap. Yeah, these are kindergarten kids. Yeah, I mean, this, 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 is what, this is what the United States is getting for their money. It's, it's, it's obscene. And um, we, don't, we also cut off all funding to the Palestinians, you know, writ large. We didn't, we didn't pay for anything. And because we didn't see that that money was going for anything other than the corrupt purposes of the leadership. You know, it just didn't make any sense. Um... I, look, I hope that policy changes. I, I can guarantee you it'll change with, in a Republican administration. But, um, you know, th- there are these... Uh, look, if, there's, if, you could, if you could kind of boil down the philosophical differences between, you know, the way we look at the world and the way, you know, our friends who are Democrats look at the world, they think you can solve problems with money, and they think that you could turn people from being evil to being, you know, not evil by being nice to them and giving them money. Okay, and, and we know that that's just not true. We could give, you know, the Palestinian people are the most indulged and coddled people in the entire world. Yeah, I call them. They receive more international funding per capita than anyone else in the world. Has it done any good? I mean, it's done great for Suha Arafat. She's living on the Champs de Lisee. You know, shopping every day. And Mahmoud Abbas and all of his children. Uh, Abbas and Ismail Khani is li- and uh, Khaled Mashal are living in, in the Four Seasons Hotel in Carter with five, six billion dollars in net worth each. So it's great for them, but it doesn't do any good. And we just, you know, the, the liberal mentality is, you know, as long as we feel good, the results don't matter. So mm-hmm. we're going to virtue signal by sending money abroad to people that we think need it. And then it's not what they do with it is up to them. We feel good. We've done our part. You know, and, and our view is, look, we're not going to spend tax ter- taxpayer money unless there's a discernible benefit. And in fact, not only was there no benefit, it was having exactly the opposite effect. So we have to end this addiction to throwing money at problems without demanding accountability. So I want to go now to the next geopolitical challenge for Israel and in terms of what I say, our hands being tied behind our back. Because I am sure you're very familiar with the statement, you, you want to kill the snake, get to the head of the snake, yeah. right? Well, Qatar or Qatar, mm-hmm. as, as many of us Americans say, is a, is a major funder of Hamas, the funder, sponsor of Al Jazeera, which spews total anti-Semitic, anti-Israel agenda, anti-America agenda. Mm-hmm. And yet, Israel can't go after Qatar because Qatar is a key player in the Middle East for the Middle East. Yeah. It's the, lo- the largest U.S. military bases in Qatar. How is Israel supposed to stop the, the head of the snake in this type of geopolitical situation? Well, I would, I, I'll tell you the truth. I, mean, I would not argue that they're the head of the snake. I think that, that Iran is the head of the snake. That I was think, my next question. I think Qatar is a, is a country that likes to be on all sides of, of all issues. And that's, that's their approach. Here's, what, here's the way I've always looked at this when I was in office as well. Um, the, the, the most important player here in this whole conflict is Israel. Okay, it's not any of these other countries, it's Israel. It's Israel's ability to have a national consensus about what it has to do to protect its citizens and to execute 
on that plan. When it does that, okay, and it makes the case for it and it explains it, it'll have its enemies, okay, just like it always will, but it'll also have people who will understand it, and then it has to go and execute on a strategy. And, and, you know, I always say when Israel respects itself, the world will respect Israel. Amen. And we have to stop, I say we because I'm Jewish and deeply associated with Israel, even though I'm not an Israeli citizen, but we have to stop worrying about the world, and we have to stop worry about our own citizens, our own people. We have to we have to respect their views. I'm not saying that we I'm not saying we need to do a particular thing. I think we need to have the conversation. We need to raise it with the people. We need to, people need to campaign on these types of issues. They need to select the government, and they need to execute on a cohesion strategy where Israel will be safe. That's what mature countries do. And I'm in 100% agreement with you. And I think you would agree with me as well that for the first time since my mature years, I believe only because this horrendous tragedy where you, today you have a situation where left-wing Israelis are sounding more right-wing than right-wingers. Yeah. And it's only because this horrific tragedy has woken is, even left-wing Israelis to wake up and realize, oh my God, we have this evil, barbaric people sitting amongst us. And Israelis realize it's not just in Gaza, it's Judea and Samaria, even Israeli Arab Muslim citizens. It's this new reality that finally there's this consensus to act like this. And now the challenge is, and correct me if I'm wrong, is Netanyahu in this government going to stand up and do everything that's necessary according to basically how you're talking right now? Look, I think, again, I, 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 this was, you know, my, my reaction uh, to this, again, in a very kind of macro sense, was this. Um, the government has lots of explaining to do. Okay, I mean, I'm not, none of us are really in a position right now to identify particular fault. It's all going to come out, and I'm, it's not worth getting into right now. But the government writ large failed, failed the people of Israel. And, um, but the people of Israel are unbelievable, right? So as, 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 as much as the government failed, and you know, again, I don't mean to be critical of a particular person, but any time, uh, you know, when you have this type of a, of, of a, of a uh, attack and an assault and, and a massacre with regard to a, a fence that hasn't been breached in 50 years, I mean, it's, it's as they say in, uh, in Latin, you know, race ipsua loquitur, the action speaks for itself. You don't need to do a, do a deep dive to know that somebody messed up, right? right? So government failed. But then the reaction of the people, all the people, the left, the right, the center, the charedim, the secular, unbelievable, right? Thousands of charedim for the first time rushing to enlist. The amount of chesed, the amount of mesirat nefesh, you know, the amount of, of self-sacrifice that continues even to this day, um, you know, in, in every part of the world, by the way, not even just in Israel, but all right. across the diaspora. Uh, I also haven't seen that in my lifetime. Right. So we're paying a massive price. Nobody should ever have to pay this kind of a price for Jewish unity, but the people are united, and the people will decide, you know, whether they want to keep the existing government or change governments, whatever, that'll come. But I trust the people of Israel tremendously. Whether you trust the government or not, I trust the people. And because I trust the people, I think the people of Israel will get to the right place. No, I, and I know you know that I agree 100% with that. It's definitely the message I'm putting out every single day. And it's, also, it's a spiritual revolution taking place where we're, we're taking back ownership and stopping to outsource. And it's us and trusting God. It's us, the little people, and God understanding in the middle. And not just the government, but also leadership of the army and intelligence. Yeah. All failures, I have to go. So one more question about Israel, and then I wanted to return back to America. And um, my question about Israel is this. I think you would agree with me if I would describe the Palestinian Authority basically as a paper tiger, as an entity that hasn't gone to elections in 17 years because it knows that if it would, it would lose tremendously because the streets of Judea and Samaria are basically Hamas supporters. Yeah, I think it'd be charitable to them, but yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So Israelis have woken up and realized that what happened on the southern border can happen any second at any one or all of the communities in Judea and Samaria. I mean, my, my unit right now is protecting the Gush Etzion area. I was in my reserve duty before I came here on this speaking trip. I'm going to return to it. We are standing at guard knowing as we're surrounded by hundreds of thousands of Arabs that at any moment they could do to us exactly what happened down south. Yep. Do you think there is that understanding or leeway for Israel to be able to do what is necessary in Judea and Samaria against the whole terror infrastructure throughout as we're doing in Gaza? 
uh, in, in Israel or in America? America. The, in Israel, there's that understand uh, that we have the understanding. I, I think you know. I mean, I think just the opposite. I think um, I think the Biden administration views Judea and Samaria as belonging to the Palestinians. Um, he made this kind of absurd uh, demand that uh, Israel curb settler violence. As I, if, insane. As if settler violence is somehow the dominant violence in Judea and Samaria. It's like. I, when, I, when people ask me about settler violence, I say, well, that's, that's what you call man bites dog, right? That's so rare that, you know, it's as rare as a man biting a dog, whereas the violence the other way is, is, where, the, is where the dog bites the man. And it's not worth reporting because it happens all the time. But um, no, I mean, I think that's, you know, look, the, uh, America, and, and, you know, it's not a democratic issue because George Bush the first tried to do the same thing after the first Iraqi war. The war was over, the poor Israelis are taking Scud missiles in and they're not responding because, you know, the coalition would have broken down if Israel joined the coalition. And then, you know, after that, the Bush is pushing, well, now that we've, you know, now that we've solved this war, we're gonna go have a two-state solution. It's like, why should Israel be punished? Right. Because, because of this. I think that um, the two-state solution was never alive. I don't wanna say it's dead, because that implies that there was a time when it had life. I think it's, I think it's a pipe dream. I think it's just this, this hypothetical notion uh, that will never occur. And, um, and, and the reason it will never occur, and the reason why um, this particular uh, war uh, is, is putting the final nail in the coffin, is because this war enables people to see into the hearts of the Palestinians. Um, and, it's a, and, and, in, and in many cases, they're looking at a piece of coal. That's what they're looking at. Right? These are people who, not just the, not just the animals. I shouldn't say animals because I love animals. It's worse than animals. Subhuman. I use subhuman. Not just, just the, the barbarians who committed the atrocities, but but those that are cheering on. I mean, so many people cheering and cheering and cheering. And you see the polls coming out now. 80, 90 percent of Palestinians agree. And Cornell University professors and yeah. citizens of New York City and Washington and cities all over the world. So with that. Um, who, who are you making a state with? You know, like it's not, it's, you know, and, you know, then people say, well, you know, it's Israel's fault. They, they should have been nicer to, you know, I, I say, I don't even care. It doesn't even matter. Like it doesn't matter how the Palestinian people became so barbaric and cruel. It doesn't matter. You know, you want to attribute, I mean, we can debate, it doesn't matter. I mean, Israel does not have an obligation to commit suicide, which is essentially what they'll be doing if they agree to a two-state solution. And I, I just want to throw in, yeah. to, to that point, I think it's important that people understand, they were massacring us in 1936, they were massacring us in 1929, yeah. before the Jewish state of Israel was, came to exist, before Israel was in Judea and Samaria, before settlements, etc., etc. So yeah. put things in perspective. Yeah, yeah but, but I'm saying, you know, um, you know, people have short memories. Mm -hmm. and, um, but but this, this was, I think, very much eye-opening, as you point out to people on the left, to people... And, and, and look, even people on the left who, who, who you know, they may really want the, they, they may have loved the idea of, you know, this idyllic, you know, set of two states living side by side in peace and heart. But I think that they recognize it's, it, it's not going to be these two states. I mean, maybe some other place in the world, you know, that can happen. But, but not given the, the amount of, of hatred, the cruelty, you know, the violence, um, the, the, and, and, and the, um, to, to a large extent, the, um, the, 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 the way that it fits into people's faith, even. You know, that, that, that they believe it's, it's, not only is it not wrong, but it's God's will for them to dominate the infidels and to, and to rape their women. I mean, it's, 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 it's an ideology that is um, so abominable, so, so, so inconsistent with peaceful coexistence that... Um, it's just never going to happen. I mean, it, it, I mean, I wouldn't do it for lots of other reasons too. I mean, I don't believe that the land of Israel should be divided, but um, but on, on a pure, you know, just geopolitical perspective, it just it's, it would be suicide for Israel. Right. So I want to come back to the United States for the last question. I think I have plenty of criticism of this Biden administration before the war, during the war. I mean, three of the main points that they're using the war to push the two-state solution, which all, mostly all Israelis are against it. So yeah. good luck to Biden on, on trying to put, put that, continuing to fund UNRWA, uh, uh, calling out this, this, this fake campaign to deflect 
the tragedy and the massacre and the evil of our enemies, fo focusing on settler violence. It's, it's just sick, sick, sick. With that, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this, we're, by the next time we have a Democrat administration, we're going to be crying for a Biden administration. It looks like the Democrat Party is turning very, very quickly to be an publicly anti-Israel and policy-wise. How long do you think we have in America until that happens? I don't know. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a tough question. Um, the party's divided right now. Um, the energy in the party is in the anti-Israel movement. Uh, most of the folks who are pro-Israel are in their 50s, 60s, you know, 70s. They're kind of the old time. I call them the steady hoyer, you know, Democrats, the ones who kind of have reflexively been with Israel for their whole careers, whether they, whether they, you know, want a two-state solution or not, doesn't doesn't make someone a bad person. Just makes them naive. But so you have that that kind of pro-Israel two-state crowd in the Democratic Party, um, who I think at times like this you see they're coming very much to Israel's defense. And then you got the other half of it, which is now people will say it's not the half; it's only you know the squad and a few others. But it's bigger than that. And the reason it's bigger than that is because you see the people, the energy, the 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 the, 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 the there's these, these uh, demonstrations, all, you know, these violent demonstrations all around the country. So, um, yeah, like, uh, it's, it's, it's a real problem. And it's a failure of uh, leadership. It's a failure of universities. Um, it's a failure of parents to, uh, to, to provide, you know, values-based education. Um, you know, it's just, um, it, it signals to me um, a real risk that we'll see the end of the American empire which unfortunately in history every empire has an arc, you know, and, uh, and ours looks like it's on the downslope right now. I, I hope I'm wrong. Um, I'll tell you something though, just, you know, your, your viewers just give you, end on a, on a positive note. So um, when I was on Fox News, um, I'm almost every day with Fox News, but I was on Fox News last week, and right after, the, after the, it aired, I get a call from my, my, my good friend Mike Pence, who I hadn't spoken to, in a few months. And, you know, he calls me and says, just so you know, Fox, I was thinking if you wanted to say hello. I said, well, it's great to hear from you. I said to him, you know, um, I, I, I don't know that I'm really achieving anything. I'm kind of preaching to the choir on Fox News. I don't know if I'm changing anybody's mind. And he said to me, well, let me just tell you something. He said, you know, you know New York. You know, you know Washington. Maybe you know California. Um, uh, but I know the whole country. I know the country better than you, a lot better than you. I know everything in between. And I've been to every one of these states, and I've campaigned in every one of these states, and I have the people in every one of these states. And America's with Israel. Don't, 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 don't think for a second it's not. It's not, you know, 55, 45, or 60, 40, he says. It's like 90, 10. Wow. He said, don't, don't, don't give up. I mean, the country is with you. It's just that all the noise on the coasts, just like, you know, you know, you, you know the, the, the news is dominated by the 10 cities on the coasts and the the shoplifting on the coast. But the people of America are good people. They love Israel. They support Israel. They know they have the right values and, um, and don't give up. And I really appreciated the call. And, and, he, and he's absolutely right. He does know America much better than me. And, uh, and I hope he's right. I said, don't hope you're right. I think he's right. But, you know, uh, time will tell. But um, th there is a whole America out there that we don't see. And uh, good, fine people with good values uh, God-believing people, uh, people who believe that, uh, many people believe that the land of Israel was given to the Jewish people, you know, through God's covenants with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I mean, there, there are a lot of good people still out there, and um, uh, I think it's too soon to give up on America. Final, final question. Please, God, there is voted in a Republican administration. Are we going to be blessed with the involvement of David Friedman once again? Uh, I, I would I would privilege to be involved. Sure, I uh, look. I, I think America at its best is is very much part of God's covenant. I think you know when we do our best and we project the right values and we stand with Israel. I think we're we're partners. We're really partners in God's plans, and I hope that uh, I get that opportunity to serve again. U.S. Foreign Ambassador David Freeman to Israel, thank you so, so much for everything you did, everything you continue to do. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. Everyone.
I hope you enjoyed today's episode, all the insights from someone who had a front seat and maybe will have a front seat again. In the meantime, he has the front seat as a Jew and someone very, very deeply committed to the Jewish people and the Jewish state of Israel. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Pulse of Israel. If you are not yet a subscriber, go pulseofisrael.com, click to subscribe. And if you like this episode and you want to help us get it seen by many more people, click on the donate button on pulseofisrael.com. In the meantime, signing off from beautiful, sunny Southern, California, Southern Florida. Looking forward to seeing you all back in the beautiful ancestral homelands of the Jewish people and in Jerusalem, David. Amen. Shalom, Amen. Shalom, everyone. Pulse of Israel, frontline videos from the Holy Land. Support our work by donating today.